Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for your patience this morning. Welcome. Uh, just a quick shout out to the friends. I just want to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring today's program. Um, and I think we're just going to jump right in. So I am <laughs> extremely pleased to have today's guest with us today. We have Dr. Dorothy Borse from Gordon College. Uh, she joined Gordon in 1999, and she's worked to bring a greater understanding of the complex interactions among wildlife and the environment to the Gordon community and the wider world. Her primary research interests are in aquatic community ecology and invasive species. Dorothy also spends a great deal of time studying the integration of faith and science, particularly in the realm of environmental ethics. In the past several years, her time has been devoted to authoring a major environmental science textbook. She is a fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation, and she sometimes writes for the InterVarsity Web community that serves women in the, in the academy and professions. And she's also a co-author of Environmental Science, published by Pearson, a textbook written with Gordon Professor Emeritus Richard Wright. Please give a warm welcome to Dorothy Borse. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you uh, for your hospitality. And um, when I was first asked, the reason I was asked was because I gave a similar talk at Gordon. Although in that talk, I focused more on the ponds that were particularly on Gordon's campus and in the Gordon and Tobacco Woods. For this talk, I've broadened it out. And one of the things that we'll talk about is uh, where your water comes from as it's diverted from the Ipswich River. But to answer that question, we do have to focus more on um, Hamilton and Wenham and uh, the very top of Beverly. So just to give you an overview, I'm going to start in my own backyard. There's a big pond um, that I look out on mm. called Koi Pond, and I'm about to sneeze. Uh, see if that happens. <laughs> Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how this region has changed over time because that has a big impact on waterways. And we'll talk about a broader group of ponds, Tobacco Lake, um, the town of Hamilton and some of its water issues, Wenham Lake and some of its water quality issues, the Ipswich River, the Great Wenham Swamp, and some other ponds. So. I look out on this from the building I do my work in. I'm on the biology faculty and I am an aquatic ecologist. Uh, in this area, most of my research with students has been done on vernal pools. And for those of you, how many are familiar with vernal pools? Yeah, some of you are probably on citizen science teams where you go out and track um, salamanders marching in the spring to lay their egg masses. Uh, <clears throat> so I do work on vernal pools. Prior to having a PhD in oceanography and limnology, which was uh, what made me an aquatic ecologist, I have a degree in entomology as well, and, and that's uh, the study of insects. This combination makes me a tremendous hit with kids under the age of 10, <laughs> since <laughs> I know about bugs and frogs. <laughs> so I have a lot of fun here. I've had many times just a happy time showing kids what can happen in a pond, but if we were to back up, this is what it looks like. You can see the fall beginning so the building that I'm in is on the other side of that athletic field right here, um, looking out over the pond. So Koi Pond is one of five great ponds. Those are ponds larger than 10 acres that are in this Gordon and Tobacco Wood um, complex. Gull Pond is right here. We won't say very much about Gull, but do you know, just do you know anything about this well about this pond complex? No. Okay. Gull Pond is interesting because it was dug as a burrow pit, which is a pit where they 
take out sand to use in the building of Route 128 when 128 came north. So if we were at Gordon, I was giving this, I would talk a little bit more about the hydrology of the area. But one of the big things that has happened has been the pulling of 128 up here has made a lot more rapid runoff of water into this area. And so um, that water also has uh, more contaminants than water would have had before that. And so the, and, and the um, building of up the development of those buildings also pushes water uh, into the, into Koi Pond and that is causing it to turn uh, into a eutrophic pond. That is one that has a lot of nutrients. In the back of that, you can see gravelly and roundy. You should see Beck Pond. And uh, I think there's one other pond beyond it. But what you should notice is how flat and low everything is. This is mo like, even though it's not entirely water, the water table is very, very high. And we're just two miles from the ocean and we're in that flat zone as we move out into the ocean. What beach are we seeing there? Um, can I tell you, I don't know. That's because I have to like reorient myself every time. If I said something, it would be wrong and then I'd be really embarrassed. <laughs> So um, let me tell you a little bit about the history of this area. The last ice age was about 11,000 years ago, and it began retreating. Yeah. So, you don't remember that? That's right. I don't remember it either. <laughs> um, but the last ice age came down w well past us, that Laurentine ice sheet. So if I was to stand on the edge of Koi Pond, let's go back to that, 11,000 years ago, there would have been a mile of ice above my head. And in that time since that, as the ice declined and the glaciers moved, they left piles of rubble and there's different names for different kinds of piles, drumlins and askers and that kind of thing. And they dug holes and left chunks of ice. When a chunk of ice was left, and then it melted over time and left a pond or a lake, that's called a kettle hole. How many of you have heard of kettle holes? Yeah, okay. And so there's numerous kettle hole wetlands and that kind of thing. We know some of this about the way that um, the ice sheet left from the work of Louis Agassi, who was, started the Museum of Natural History at Harvard and who um, the Agassi Rock Reservation is named after because he went there and did some of his glacial work. He saw stripes in the rock that were made from the glacier moving and dragging, and he was the, considered the father of modern glacial theory. So when all of that ice is moving back, new things are moving in, but you can imagine there's this massive, very long-term movement of uh, plants and animals northward. So if we leap ahead <laughs> to pre-settlement, this would be, say, in the 1600s or something like that, this would have been what a forest might have looked like in this area. This is from a series of dioramas at Harvard Forest that try to describe, so you can visualize, what the forests were like at different um, points. So there was a lot of natural variation across sites and there were human impacts. For example, um, Many Native Americans set fires that cleared out understory and that promoted the growth of oaks. And acorns were an important part of the diet of 
Native Americans at that time. In this area, that would have been the Agawa. So you can see a mix of older trees and younger trees in this as well. But I want to spend a little time back on this, this region because I'm going to show how it's changed over time. This is a picture from 1952. The building that I work in would be right here, but it's not there, obviously. And one of the things that you can see is how many trees are along the pond, right? And you can see all the way out to the road, there's really not any development there. And then this is 1971. It's a slightly different angle. And this, so this is the set of trees. And you can see that that development goes all the way out to Grapevine. You can see that the development has occurred up here. And so there's a lot faster movement of water into Koi. And we'll see that increase even more. But at this point, <clears throat> There was a septic system, and the septic system is, of course, what Hamilton and Wenham have, but this has the highest concentration of people in one place of Hamilton and Wenham. So that was not sustainable. And in the 50s and 60s, they worked to move from the septic system to being on Beverly, water and sewer. So Gordon is right at the edge of uh, Wenham and Beverly, right down Hall Street is that switch. And so Gordon is included in the Beverly sewer and water. This is a picture from 1975. You can see all the trees. <clears throat> that looks pretty similar. This is a picture from 1994. Very, very lush, and you can still see a lot of trees around. Um, and of course, it's kind of interesting to watch this area grow up with trees. When <clears throat> the Prince family owned this estate before the school bought it, they actively pumped water out of this region. And they pumped it over to what's now the Parsons Hill Complex, where they had a pond. And they use this for their secondary polo field. <laughs> and, yeah. So when the school bought the property, they stopped pumping. And the combination of not pumping anymore and the building of 128 has made this get wetter and wetter and it's, you know, it's no longer used as a field at all. In fact, this tennis court, which is no longer in use, <clears throat> when it was built, was a state-of-the-art floating mesh tennis court. That is, it was specifically made to, <clears throat> to be able to be on very wet soil and not sink. This underneath, this entire strip is about 19 feet of peat. If we had stood there right after the glacier moved out of this area, that would have been a lot deeper water. But what happened over the, all the years is that all these areas filled in with a lot of peat, which I'll mention again. So this is today. You can see a lot of plant life in the one picture, and you can see uh, cattle egret and a lot of uh, water plants. The water plants are taking those nutrients out of the water, but at the loss of open water is the, and many of you are nodding at this because you live near and love ponds that this is happening to. Tobacco Lake has that as well, and we'll mention that later. So this is an overview of what you could see um, last year. This is from the other side of it. You can see a lot of pond lilies, you can see a dock, and you can see the building that I'm in uh, as well. Okay. Now, that's a lot about a pond I know very well, but understanding that pond is a part of a matrix of understanding Chebacco Lake and its surrounding ponds. So if we can orient ourselves, this is Koi Pond, 
And we can picture Chebacca Lake as that big amorphous looking one. Beck Pond, Roundy, and Gravelly Ponds are there as well. <clears throat> and you can see that a whole number of towns <laughs> are all interested in that. Beverly is right here, and we'll see why Beverly is so interested in this in a little bit. And then Manchester, Wenham, and Hamilton, even Essex is interested because it's got some headwaters there. But one of the big interests is in Chebacco Lake. And this is the watershed of Chebacco Lake. If you can picture just that section that I pointed out in the last slide, Chebacco is the big one there. This is Koi still. This is round and gravelly. And <clears throat> see Alewife Brook coming out the top. Actually, that's gonna head to the ocean, and it's called that because alewife, which are little ocean-going fish that come back to breed, come up that. In <laughs> fact, there is some historical idea that they used to come all the way back to Koi Pond, though alewife are not as common as they used to be, and they don't anymore. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Tobacco Lake, when I was a kid and I went to Essex at a camp in Tobacco Lake, can you explain to me why when we went into the water and then came out there was this blackish, um, uh, well, I can't explain it, a film or something. We used to get it when we came out every single time. Mm -hmm. I will have to give that some yeah. thought. If it had been greenish or reddish, I might have had a quicker answer. Well, so I have to think about that. Yeah. It's possible that it was a kind of single-celled al algae that was common in the water and coated you. Um, it's also possible that it was something that was a product of decaying vegetation. Yeah. And that would be my other guess. Okay. <clears throat> So Chebacca Lake is about 209 acres, and in comparison, Koi Pond is about 22 acres, so it's about 10 times the size. Um, it's open to the public for use for swimming and boating and fishing, but the entire lake has an average of only nine feet in depth, so it's very shallow. The maximum depth is 22 feet. Koi, which is a tenth of the size, is um, seven feet at the deepest, and a great deal of it is about two feet deep. So it's only, it goes out Alewife, which I pointed out, and that's 1.7 miles to the Essex River, and that's uh, how it would go to the sea. Now, some of you also follow water quality issues, and this is called fanwort sometimes, it's called kabamba weed. This took over um, Chebacco Lake, and it just was found recently in Beck Pond. Um, and it's a terrible invasive species that's very hard to get rid of. <clears throat> and it thrives because there's a lot of nutrients there. Now I want to make another um, comment about a feature that we don't see as much of as we would have a long time ago. <clears throat> In 1928, beavers were found in West Stockbridge, Massachusetts. They had not lived in Massachusetts since 1750. So even before 1750, people had hunted the beavers out of Massachusetts. Um, in fact, in 1932, people had tried to reintroduce um, and released three beavers <laughs> somewhere in Massachusetts, but it didn't take. Uh, and then that beaver population did actually <laughs> grow. By 1946, there were 300 beavers um, in this region, but it wasn't until 1952 that you were allowed to take a selected number of beavers. I often, as a wetland ecologist, talk to people who don't like beavers. 
So <laughs> let me just say that the philosophy of humans about land and the philosophy of beavers are not compatible. <laughs> Beavers are ecosystem engineers that continuously take dry land and turn it into water and then allow it to return back to dry land. And humans in general buy a piece of land and feel appalled if it changes from what they started, if, unless they have instituted the change. So Beavers and humans do not uh, have the same expectation of what will happen to a plot of land. But let me just say that wetlands agree with the beavers. <laughs> so it's very difficult to meet the needs of people and try to maintain ecosystem integrity. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about Hamilton because Hamilton is right there and Hamilton, unlike down in Beverly where we have sewer and water, they have um, town wells. And so they do have wells, they've got about six of them, and around each of the pump pads, they have land protecting the whole water supply. Now I did some looking to try and find a good picture of this and I could, I was not able to. The Pine Street pump, for example, has a wellhead and there's about 110 acres around it that are protected. Some areas of Bradley Palmer State Park, the purpose is to protect the wellhead there. Um, and sections of the Great Wenham Swamp, we'll talk about a bunch in a few, uh, few minutes. So uh, one of the problems that Hamilton has is because of increased water consumption per capita. So here's the dilemma. Hamilton ha and Wenham both have a more rural um, style and they are trying to preserve open space. So they zoned for large lot sizes, which means they won't end up with a lot of pavement and they won't end up with a lot of crowding, which sounds great. But in fact, on a per person use of resources, Houses built on large lots are usually much larger houses. And if they water their lawns, they actually use a lot more water per person than in a more densely populated area. So one of the difficulties that they have is that um, adequate drinking water for Hamilton and water quality because of nutrient runoff, especially into Tobacco Lake, are big problems. And in fact, this is why they have a near constant water ban. So you may wonder why don't, don't all the cities have the same water bans? And we'll talk a little bit about why Beverly doesn't usually have a water ban, but um, with Hamilton and Wenham, it's because they're using well water and it's possible for the wells to go dry. <clears throat> Wenham Lake is going to be one of the centers of our story. The Beverly and Salem Water Board um, uses Wenham Lake as a reservoir along with two other reservoirs, Putnamville Reservoir right over here and this little thing which is the Longham reservoir, both of which have dams at them to back up the water for later use. <clears throat> so the water goes through a filtration plant in Beverly and then it is pumped. So I live very close to the water tower in Beverly, if you can orient yourself to that, in North Beverly. And then also I've been to the Beverly water treatment plant, the uh, drinking water treatment plant. Have any of you ever been there? Yeah, okay. Where is that? It's in North Beverly and it's near the end of Wenham Lake, but I couldn't tell you the street address. Yeah? Well, uh, if, if you're on Route 1A, Somerset, Salem, um, all those roads go down to Arlington, they all end at the lake. 
So if you're coming from Nix, right? South, yes. It's on your right hand side. Okay. Does that make sense? A couple hundred yards. Yeah. Okay. Before you get to the Shaw's Plaza. Before you get to the Shaw's Plaza, right? Got it. Okay, Wenham Link is historically important, and we will talk about some of its changes over time, both now and a little bit later. <clears throat> but when European settlers came to this area, it was noted for having crystal clear water. And in fact, that's why there was such an ice cutting business. People cut large chunks of ice, packed them in um, hay, and shipped them around the world, including to Queen Victoria. It was considered some of the best ice because it was before refrigeration. There were ice boxes, and it was uh, the best ice. It was also very, very good fishing. Uh, Wenham Link is a part of the Ipswich River watershed, which you see here. So just to or orient ourselves again, it's on the edge of the watershed to the Ipswich River. Here's Wenham Lake. Here's the Putnamville Re Reservoir. The Long, uh, Long Reservoir is going to be someplace there. <clears throat> so all the water um, so the Ipswich River is carrying water this direction, and Wenham Lake was full of uh, fish and everything. Then what happened was, and I don't remember the date on this, but if you can picture, while this is all low in the landscape, the water is flowing this way, and it's sort of flowing through up in this direction from Wenham Lake into the Great Wenham Swamp. So engineers came in and they took a canal from the river that avoided the swamp and went straight to the lake. That canal, the, the value of going through the swamp was that the water got a lot clearer. And that's because the plants took all the stuff out of it. When the um, canal came through, suddenly there was a straight shot from more polluted water into a very pristine lake. Mm -hmm. And that immediately changed the water quality of the lake. So it was no longer crystal clear. Not all the fish were there. A lot of other changes occurred. <clears throat> So that meant that suddenly that Wenham Lake area had been a place, at one point um, there was a steamboat on it. There were all these things that happened and um, people lived around it. But uh, after that, they, they set outside the land around it and they lowered the different things that you can do in it. So uh, recreation is very restricted and in that area now it's protected. Is the when was the canal there? But the canal is still here and actually I have it in my notes for a different slide <laughs> so if at the end I could go back and check. Um, I don't remember the date of that. Excuse me, uh, in an earlier picture I saw Beverly Airport and it seemed awful close to the waterways. Uh, you are yeah, very, right yes. Hasn't that affected? It did. In fact, in 2001, a fly ash from several, that was polluted with a number of modern toxic chemicals coming from the airport and from a tannery and some other businesses was found in Wenham Lake. And I, had, I hadn't been in this area for very long. I, I got invited to a meeting. I remember meeting Jan Schlickman, who was the um, person the lawyer who worked on that, <clears throat> and he said uh, the water at that point, was, all of the levels of pollution were well below drinking water safety levels. But it did raise the question, do you wait until they're not to do something? And in fact, 
they made a case that something ought to be done and the <coughs> Salem power station had produced most of those, but they had been stored illegally by this other group. In other words, that was then, I believe, out of business. And so who owned the problem was part of that discussion. You probably remember some of that from the early 2000s. <clears throat> Tally fly ash that. Yeah, and then they cleaned that up um, and did some renovation, uh, you know, restorations. So this, let's go back to the Ipswich River for a little bit. This is, it winds 45 miles. It goes from Burlington to the Plum Island Sound in Ipswich. Um, it is 155 square uh, miles of, um, of drainage and it runs through all or part of 21 communities. It supports uh, fisheries, shell bed, uh, shellfish beds, and the streams and aquifers are used by 350,000 people. When I first came to this area, the American Rivers had recently named the Ipswich River as one of the 10 most um, endangered rivers in the country. They put out a list every year. That was because of the high amount of diversion and some of, because of pollution issues. But the biggest was diversion. So this is from um, the Ipswich River water. No, this is from MassGov has um, something about an Ipswich River uh, project and this describes what happens when you have a lot of development by a river. So here is a river running through an uh, area with a lot of trees. When water comes down, 50% of it goes down into the groundwater, 10% is running off, about 40% is evaporated or it goes up through plants that's called transpiration that together evapotranspiration is about 40 percent. Now we've built a lot of impervious surface. We've built sidewalks and roads and rooftops. When water comes down only 15 percent is soaking into the ground. Hold on just a second I'll have your question. And then the runoff is much higher and evapotranspiration <coughs> is actually lower because the runoff is so high. Now, what were you going to ask? You say before and after. What are the dates? This is a diagram of what kind of thing happens that you could use to describe any place this occurs. This is not. This is an example. Oh. So this is not a single place on the Ipswich River where we've actually done those numbers. But <clears throat> what you can see is that development has the impact of increasing the speed with which water leaves the landscape. That is true, that is one of the biggest single things that humans have done. And it's one of the reasons why both floods and droughts occur in more frequently in a heavily developed landscape. Because if it runs off soon, it doesn't stay. You don't have it later. So you get that drought. And if it runs off soon, it's in the middle of Danvers Square. Mm -hmm. It's wherever you thought you were going to drive. <clears throat> but in 2016, many of you probably remember this uh, happening in the Ipswich River. Animals were dying. This is uh, Ipswich River Watershed Association having a breakfast in the middle of the river in the riverbed. This is another part of the riverbed. <clears throat> Were you asking something? No. I, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> so one of the things I want us to get is that the Ipswich River Watershed Association um, came into um, prominence after the American Rivers said that the Ipswich River was in real trouble. And this represents 
all of the communities are stakeholders in the Ipswich River and they work especially to keep down diversion. Now, we get our water from Wenham Lake and our water is diverted from the Ipswich River. So in Beverly and Salem, even in Danvers, we've got, um, we've, we take water from the Ipswich River. One of the reasons why Beverly, though, does not have a water ban as often is because the water that comes uh, diverted is diverted in the winter when there's a lot more water. And then in the summer, we are not taking water out. <coughs> I have to say, as a person talking about uh, aquatic systems in this region, that most people have no idea at all why in one town you can be watering your lawn and the next town up you're not even allowed to wash your car you know for a few minutes with a hose and i think it would be useful for beverly and salem to talk about water saving when other people have to but um but that's probably a conversation for another time <laughs> So I, I want to say a little bit about the Great Wenham Swamp. Um, if we go all the way back to the settlers when Wenham was first being settled by Europeans, um, a prominent pastor went and sat on the edge of Wenham Lake and uh, he wrote a sermon about Enon which is a word in the Bible. And it's a description of a beautiful place. And that's where we get Enon Street. That's where, and Enon was their early name for Wenham. Initially, the Great Wenham Swamp, which has like 50 islands in it that are left from rubble and there's trees on them, Many of them are only accessible by boat and only about 12 of them are big enough to really have names and be talked about very much. Um, was initially a comet and people went in to get hay, they went in to get timber, and they went in to get peat. So I talked about peat a, a while ago and let's just say that peat is undecayed, compressed, aquatic plant vegetation. You'd hear about it in Scotland where they have tremendous peat um, bogs and it's burnable. It's a very dirty burning fuel and you can't get a blazing fire out of it. But people could use it to do some heating or cooking. So people used this and then it wasn't very long before too many people were using it and they tried to divide it up and there were made different sections, each of which had eight families and they removed the timber. By the time of George Washington, George Washington wrote to somebody that all the timber between Boston and Salem had already been removed. That is, that settlers were very, very early cutting and so we're north of that but they had come up and they were settling and the use of timber by far outstripped the growth of trees Boston between Boston and Salem okay. was what he said well, and this was part of Salem back then yes and yeah. yes okay so right here what you see is that something I should pay attention to okay <laughs> um, what you see here is the Danvers and Wenham um, part of the Great Wenham Swamp that had a walkway built. I think it's, forget how long that is. Um, and you can see an overview of it. You see Choke Pond. You can see some of the islands that people talk about. I often go there to walk my dog, lots of people do. Um, and that rail trail goes by there. So the Great Wenham Swamp uh, has a lot of organisms that live in it. Uh, fishers, sometimes people call them fisher cats, but they're really in the weasel family. 
and raccoons and white-tailed deer and coyotes and all sorts of things, <coughs> lots of birds, all sorts of things live in there. Now I'm just going to mention a couple of ones that are not as well known. This is called Teal Pond and you can see how big it is and it goes through, um, through that great swamp. But here's the deal. It's really a pond wannabe. It's really a lot more like a broad flat section of the Ipswich River. Coming in, it's called the Ipswich River. Going out, it's called the Ipswich River. In there, it's like a few feet deep, really, really wide, because muddling along, and it's called Teal Pond. But it is well known for fishing. So there's brook trout and catfish and pickerel and bass of different types and American eels. Um, it's 15 feet deep in the deepest area, which we've seen many water bodies that were less, um, and it just goes through this great swamp. So one of the things that you can see is that a lot of this water area is protected. And the Ipswich River Wildlife Association run by the, or run by the um, Mass Audubon protects a lot of that great swamp. <clears throat> so let's move right out of that to the bottom of that big great swamp, which you see with the teal pond coming through and you see that, um, the green at the bottom of that is Pleasant Pond. Now originally there were two Pleasant Ponds in the area. Koi Pond on Gordon's campus was called Pleasant Pond and then later that name was changed to Koi Pond after John Koi who was an early settler. <clears throat> but Pleasant Pond is here. You can see a picture of it and it's about 43 acres so that's a lot bigger than Koi and a little bit of it is in Hamilton, most of it is in Wenham. And at one end, there's two wellheads that are pumping. And we also see on this picture the Putnamville Reservoir, which uh, we've mentioned previously. And then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Weaver Pond in Patton Park. Many of you have probably gone past this. This was dug from a swamp. So this whole region would not have been a field with a pond in it, it would have been a swamp. And they made the dry parts drier and they dug out the wet part. And so this is an artificially created pond. It's um, very well loved, has a lot of geese, has a lot of nutrients, and a few years ago, they drained it entirely and dredged it. Do you remember going by and seeing that? Um, and I don't, I'm not gonna speak to whether or not that was a good idea. I think in general, the water weeds will win in a battle between us and water weeds if the nutrients remain high and it's a shallow and warm water body. So I anticipate that we will be back to this look <laughs> shortly. <laughs> Um, and then that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. It's nice to be with you.